We're going to be doing a, a mini-series debunking Calvinism. I'm going to be spending some time, and I've taught on this subject before, and it's an important subject that needs to be taught. There are some big-name false prophets out there today that are swaying a lot of people with this doctrine. There's nothing new under the sun. It's been around for a long time. Named after John Calvin who is a, you know, a result of the Protestant Reformation, which is just Catholic light, right? The Protestants just kind of split up. They said, oh, we don't like the way Catholic Church is doing some things. They're doing things unbiblically, so we're going to change a little bit here and there. But they still baptize the babies. They still do all this other stuff. They've just changed a few things with the, with the Catholic Church. But um, John Calvin was not, I don't believe he was saved. I mean, he, he teaches a really... Uh, heretical doctrine and um, it, it's it's kind of caught on a lot of Christian churches and one of the big promoters of this doctrine these days is um, John MacArthur and John MacArthur's got these study Bibles out there and and is just you know pretty popular online and and has a great following and really has perverted the gospel and I've taught on this just a few weeks ago on where we get our sources of information when we're determining, you know, extra biblical content, right? Anything outside of the Bible when you're listening to preaching, when you're reading a book, when you're trying to learn and, and knowing who the source is. Well, if you're going to be studying and learning anything from John MacArthur, you, you got to understand, first of all, he believes in lordship salvation. Right. He believes that you have to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life in order to be saved. Now, when you make someone the Lord of your life, it means that they're telling you what to do and you're listening to them. That's what making them the Lord is, that you need to be obedient to what they say. I mean, it's plain and simple. And I, and I preach entire sermons just against him and against that doctrine, proving how completely perverted and false that is compared to just the simple, true gospel of Jesus Christ that you receive a free gift. Amen. Now, they'll say, oh, you don't believe Jesus is Lord. Yes, I do believe he's Lord, but I don't believe you have to submit to, to that authority of like, uh, you know, telling you what to do in order for salvation. You have to realize you're a sinner. You have to look to your Savior. You have to put your faith in your Savior to be saved. But it's not this weird, like, commitment. And, and it's always... You know, they're real shifty with their words, try and, trying to make it, you know, subtly confusing right. where ultimately what they're teaching is works, but they'll, they'll swear up and down that it's not works. Yep. Exactly. And, and that's the way Satan works. He's deceptive and he's trying, you know, to do this. So anyways, I, I'm bringing this up because, you know, whether we like it or not, John MacArthur has a great influence on a lot of people. Right. And he's a heretic, and he teaches this doctrine of Calvinism. But I'm going to show you some of these places in the Bible. And we're starting off with Romans 9. And really, this is going to be pretty much a Bible study of Romans 9. This is one of the very few places where a Calvinist loves to turn to because it's easier for them to twist what this, the meaning of what this is saying here. Now, the problem with listening to heretics is that once somebody gets a thought into your head, it can be really difficult to view the scripture any other way than the way that they've put it forward to you. So some people, and, and James 2 is a perfect example of this. James 2, of course, is the passage that says, you know, um, well, what, you know, what if a man, uh, um, faith without works is dead, of course. It, you know, thou say that thou hast faith, and you know, can, can faith save him? Right? And they, they have this question, well, can faith save him? And faith without works is dead. And when you have a false prophet, a false teacher, a false religion, he's showing you these things and saying, see, look, this is saying right here that faith isn't enough. You have to have works. And they'll put their spin on it, right? And tell you this false interpretation and meaning of the scripture. Once that gets embedded in your brain, it's hard to, it's hard to change that. Because then every time you read that, if you're reading your Bible regularly, you're going to keep on thinking that that's the way it is. And you know, this goes for any false doctrine that we may carry. It's difficult to fight against that. So what I'm going to do to try to combat any influence that Calvinism might have had on you and in your life is we're going to, I mean, you, the only way to do this, you got to dig in deep. You got to just, just lay everything out and understand the full context of what it is that we're seeing here. And we're going to start off in Romans chapter 9. And, and the reason why I love this so much is they, they, they jumped out. And we're going, to, we're going to get there, but let's just, I'm just going to point out real quick in case you're, you're somewhat unfamiliar. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things. Basically, let 
Oh, verse 11. So, verse 11 says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. And they take this verse and, like, and they completely run with it. And they say, See, what they'll state, and I'll just, just again, again, in case anyone's a little bit unfamiliar with what we're preaching against and what they teach, is that God is sovereign, and that word, you know, they love to use that word, so watch out for the word sovereign, okay? I have no problem with God being sovereign, but what they mean by that is different than what you would mean by that. Right. They mean that God is in charge of everything. Everything that happens, it's as if... And, you know, you might say, well, that's hyper-Calvinism, and I'm mild Calvinism, you know, whatever. Look, if you're going to take this teaching to its logical end, there is only hyper -Cal I mean, you have to just follow it all the way through to the, to, in order for, for everything to match up. But um, basically what it boils down to is God's like a puppet master, and we're just puppets on a string doing whatever it is that he wants us to do all the time that it's just he's in he's in charge he's in control so when bad things happen they happen because god made it happen when good things happen they happen because god made it happen everything that happens in this world is a result of god just making it happen for his own will for his own pleasure just because that's the way he wants to do it and you know a, a synopsis is just that god ends up choosing who is and isn't saved you're chosen you're elect and that elect is another i'm going to do an entire sermon again on the word elect and who the elect are but they'll say, see, these people were chosen by God. So they were chosen by God before the world even began, before they even did anything right or wrong, before they believed in Jesus, they were just chosen. So God picked and chose who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. And the fact that you believe is just a result that God already chose you to believe and, and made you to believe and he drew you and he, you know, whatever, this, this whole nonsense. I'm going to get into every single teaching that they teach because we're just going to study this one chapter because they like to, to add the confusion to it. So we're just going to look in context, openly, honestly, and just, just see what this chapter is even talking about. Okay? In the first eight verses, let's, just, let's read through this a little bit. I don't even have this in my notes, but I really want to get this context again. I know we read the whole chapter, but verse number one, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. This is a common theme with the Apostle Paul. He has a burden for the physical Jews, people who are physically his brethren, the Hebrews, right? He wants them to get saved. And look, this is normal. If you're Polish, if you're Italian, if you have a certain descent, it's natural for you to want your kinsmen to get the gospel and get saved too. Of course. There's nothing wrong with that. And we see that burden on the Apostle Paul's heart all throughout the Bible. But see, what's cool about the Apostle Paul is that he tried multiple times, but ultimately he still submitted himself to the will of God because God didn't send him to be a missionary to the Hebrews. He already said, you know, my, I went unto my own and my own received me not. He's like, you're going to the Gentiles. You're going and doing this work. And that's ultimately what he did. But even throughout everything, he still has this burden. He wants them to get saved. Verse 4. Who are Israelites, um, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed for every man. So he's saying, look, the, you know, the Israelites received, basically, the oracles of God. The Israelites, Johnny, get down. The Israelites received the prophets. I mean, God used them. He spoke through them. They had a great advantage. And he says, ultimately, that's who, according to the flesh, Jesus Christ was born of. He was a Jew, right? Jesus Christ was born of the lineage of David. And going all the way back up to Abraham. Fulfilling the covenant and the promise that God had made unto Abraham. And we're going to get to that in a few minutes, in a little while too, a little bit later in the sermon. So here we are, right? He's got this burden. Verse number six. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. 
but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, it, what he's starting to do now is explain, look, he's got this burden for the, for the physical Jews, but he's explaining who a child of God really is. He said, there's a difference between the physical and the spiritual. He, he's talking about, you know, well, but they're really not even of Israel. They're not really children of Israel. Because Israel was a believer, right? Abraham was a believer. When, when, the, when the people in Jesus' day were, were claiming to be Abraham's children, what did Jesus say to them? You are not the children of Abraham. If you were the children of Abraham, you'd do the works of Abraham, right? You would do the works of your father. They're saying, he's, you're not the children of Abraham because Abraham didn't go about trying to kill me. And he told them that they're of their father, the devil, right? And so now he's explaining the same concept that Jesus said right here. They're not all Israel that are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And he's explaining that, and there's a lot of symbolism here, but God made a promise to Abraham that he would have a son. Abraham lapsed in faith and had a son with Hagar. He had Ishmael, right? That was his physical son, but that was not the son that was promised to him of God. Because the, 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 the son that God promised to him was through his wife, through Sarah, and that was Isaac. That was his legitimate son. That's the son that God had promised to him. When he took matters into his own hands, when he trusted in his own flesh, he received Ishmael. But when he trusted in God and, and was relying on the promise that God had gave him, that's Isaac. And these things, the Bible explains these things are an allegory. These things are, are designed to teach us and, and, and teach a, a greater truth of who the children of promise are. It's those that, are, that have faith. The faith that Abraham had in God in, in receiving Isaac, even when he was well stricken in years, when, when Sarah was way past the time that women would normally have children, they had to have faith that God was going to keep his promise. And all throughout the Bible, now, what he's, and what he's explaining here is that if the, the real children of Israel are those that have faith, those that have put their faith in Christ. Those are the seed because they're um, counted children of the promise. So verse 8 says, that is they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. So now he's explaining that is the promise. When the Lord promised that Sarah is going to have a son. God promised him that. So uh, verse 10, and not, on, not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. So there was also another, um, you know, the promise continued obviously through the line. If you want to turn, if you would, keep your finger in Romans 9, we're coming back to it. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. Because the beginning of Romans chapter 9, he's got his burden for the, for the physical seed, but then explains that it's not about the physical seed, it's about the spiritual seed. It's about that, that being a child of promise. Galatians 3 does a great job of explaining that promise to Abraham. Look at verse number 6 of Galatians chapter number 3. The Bible reads, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness... Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Again, the same thing that Paul is teaching in Romans 9. He's saying in, here in Galatians chapter 3, if you have faith, you are a child of Abraham. Right. Jump down to verse 14 in Galatians 3. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of of the Spirit through faith. Again, there's that promise that we're going to receive. The Gentiles are going to receive that promise of the Spirit through faith. Being a child of faith, you receive that promise. Verse 15, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. 
And again, this is that word promise. That's why you notice the word promise, promise, promise comes up over and over again in Galatians 3. He saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one into thy seed, which is Christ. The promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, which is Christ. And God, of course, fulfilled that promise. Jump down to verse number 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So the, the promise is important because that's what he keeps talking about of being children of the promise in Romans chapter 9. He's distinguishing between the physical and the spiritual, being a child of promise, and um, the promise was made until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So the promise was also made to his seed, which is Jesus Christ. Look at verse 29 now in Galatians 3. The Bible reads, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Go back, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. And I know a lot of you already know this concept. This isn't, and, and I'm, I feel like I'm beating the dead horse a little bit going through this scripture, but it's, it's so evident and it's extremely important to understand this concept as we get deeper in Romans chapter 9 because this lays out the context of how we are going to understand what is written in the rest of this chapter. It's, it's not just completely unrelated topics. And what the Calvinists like to do is just pull this up. Any false teacher likes to do is pull a scripture, a verse out and just say, see, here you go. And if you let it stand on its own, it looks kind of funny. Just like in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. You just, you just pull that out. You just throw it out there. What? Well, can faith save them? Without getting the entire context, what is that chapter even talking about? And ironically enough, James chapter 2 has the references of Abraham also. It's funny that, that the salvation of Abraham is coming up in all these various false doctrines, right? James chapter 2, well, in order to understand James chapter 2, when it's talking about Abraham believing God and it being counted on him for righteousness because it brings up that story, you also ought to read Romans chapter 4. You also ought to go back to the Old Testament and read those promises that were made unto him if you want to get the full understanding of what it's even talking about. And this is what we're going to do tonight because there are references here in the New Testament. It's just, just as an aside, anytime you're reading Scripture and it says, for it is written, and then it brings up some passage from the Old Testament, if you really want to understand more, a lot more about what the New Testament is teaching, go back to that reference, find that reference in the Old Testament, and read it in context and see exactly what's going on and why it's being brought up again in the New Testament. That's going to help you out tremendously. And if, if the Calvinists did that with this passage they would not come to the conclusions that they come to about people's personal salvation being dictated by the whim of God on whatever he wanted at the moment that he decided their eternal fate. Because that's not what this chapter is talking about at all. But that is the application that is made from these verses within this chapter. Romans chapter 9. Up to this point, we were taught, he, was, he made the distinction between the flesh and the promise. Galatians 3, we know that we are children of the promise because we have faith in Christ. We are Abraham's seed according to the promise. We believe the promise, the promise that was made, the promise of Jesus Christ, the Savior, that was going to come through the, the lineage of, of Abraham. Um, so now let's go to verse number 11. Or let's reread verse number 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So the purpose of God according to election. And they're going to tell you that this means something it doesn't mean. In the context of the chapter, we're talking about the promise made to Abraham and his seed, which is Christ. Jesus is the elect. He's the chosen one. And, and you know, we're going to go into that more when I kind of go into in the study of the elect and who the elect are in the election. Uh, but in Isaiah 42, you don't have to turn there. Isaiah 42, verse 1 reads, Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect, 
in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ um, being God's elect. And you can, again, read Isaiah, you write that down, Isaiah 42, read the whole thing in context and you'll see what I'm saying is true. I'm just, for sake of time, I don't want to go through all of the context of all the references here. But that is a reference of Jesus Christ being called the elect. Isaiah 65, verse 9, is even more clear on this. Isaiah 65, 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. So he's talking about a seed being brought forth out of Jacob. And that's being, that is God's elect. So we see here, the children being not born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. These are the children of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau, right? The purpose of the election is where Jesus was going to be born from, right? The descendancy, because God knew who which line he was going to be born through. The purpose of God's election of where Jesus was going to come from, first of all, he has to keep his promise to Abraham. He has to keep his promise to Isaac, right? And he chose for Jesus, his elect, to be born of the seed of Jacob, of Israel. Now, it didn't matter. I mean, God knows the beginning from the end, but... This doesn't determine Jacob's or Esau's salvation at all. The purpose of God's election, regardless of any good or evil that, that Jacob or Esau had done, it was already predetermined that of the seed of Jacob is where Jesus was going to end up coming from. That doesn't matter. You know, their, their individual, whether or not they were saved, has nothing to do with what we're looking at here and what he's talking about. He's talking about the promise. He's talking about the fulfilling of this promise. But let's keep going here. So verse 11, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that called. And see, they like to take that verse and tell you it's all about salvation. See, God just chooses things. Before you do any good or evil, God's already determined whether, where you're going, heaven or hell. That's not what this passage is talking about. Verse number 12, It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. Now, keep your finger here in Romans 9, because now when it says, It was said unto her, Talking about Rebecca, let's go look up that reference. What is it talking about? The elder shall serve the younger. Obviously, it's talking about Jacob and Esau. Who was the elder? It was Esau. He came out first. And if you remember the story, Jacob was holding on to his ankle. Right? He's holding on to his foot as they, as they were coming out there fighting in the womb. And we're going to get to that in a minute, too. And, and as, they were, as they were being born, like Jacob's holding on to his brother Esau's foot as they're born. Real interesting story, but... Way back in Genesis 25, turn to Genesis 25, it was said unto Rebekah, the elder shall serve the younger. What is this talking about? Why is this being brought up in this context? Let's read the story. We're going to see some important, I want to take some important notes here on what we're reading when we go back and and research why this is even brought up to begin with. Genesis 25, verse 20. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. So the kids are literally fighting in her womb. And I don't know what that sensation must feel like We've never had twins, but I talked to my wife and she's, you know, kind of tries to explain to me when she's pregnant how it feels to have like this baby, you know, pushing on your bladder and pushing on other parts of your body. And, and you know, when you put your hand on the belly, you know, the, the, the kicking in the, in the hands and stuff. And it's really cool. It's neat. But I, I have no idea as a man what that sensation is like. So here we have Rebecca. She's got twins. So there's two babies in her womb. And they're like fighting with each other. And that's got to be a bizarre sensation to have your kids fighting in your womb, right? 
So she's like, what in the world is going on? And she goes you know, right, righteously to seek counsel of God, you know, to inquire of the Lord. God, wh why is this happening? Why, you know, not, is it normal for these kids to be fighting inside my womb? And verse 23, she gets an answer from God. And the Lord said unto her, look at this, two nations are in thy womb. Now, did she physically have two nations in her womb? <laughs> no, she had two children, right? Jacob and Esau. But he's describing, he says, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels and the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. This prophecy, this, this what she was told, the elder shall serve the younger. Was this specifically talking about Esau serving Jacob as the individuals? No. No. And if you read through the book of Genesis, do you ever one time see Esau just being subject to Jacob and just serving him at any point in his life? No. You have the story of Esau selling his birthright for the pottage, right? He was real hungry and he sold his birthright. He made a stupid error, but he wasn't serving Jacob. He just sold something that was really valuable for really cheap. He kind of got ripped off, but he did it to himself. Later on, Jacob stole his blessing, right? He deceived his father. He went in and, and stole that blessing. Esau wanted to kill him. So Rebekah sent Jacob away to another country to find a wife and so that Esau wouldn't kill him. He goes off. He earns his living. He gets deceived. He gets rid of the whole thing with Jacob. And then he ends up coming back. As he's coming back to his land, Jacob's the one that's concerned that Esau still has it out for him. And he's going to kill him. So what does he do? He sends all of these gifts, just, just one drove after another after another, trying to get Esau to settle down so he wouldn't kill him. Because Esau went to meet him with a whole army of people, a whole band of men. He went out to meet his brother Jacob. But by the time he got to him, you know, everything was great. But do you ever see Jacob just... You know, ruling over Esau, not once. And really, from that point on, you don't hear much at all about Jacob and Esau. It's just kind of, they do their own thing, and that's it. He's not talking about the individual. He's talking about the nations, because Jacob, his descendants, became the nation of Israel, right? That whole group of people. And the children of Esau were the Edomites, when you read about the Edomites in the Bible, those were Esau's children and his descendants, and that was an entire other nation in and of itself. And the children of Israel came into power, and the, the, the Edomites were under their control and their tribute and everything else. And, and that is what happened, and that was the prophecy, the elder shall serve the younger. It's evident from Genesis 25 that God was talking about the two nations, not the two individuals. Go back to Romans chapter 9, okay? Because again, the Calvinist tries to apply this to individual salvation. This is not what Romans 9 is referring to at all, once, ever. Look at verse, so verse number 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. We understand what that was talking about. Why was that brought up? Verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Again, as it is written, this is in Malachi chapter 1. So keep your finger here. Let's look up Malachi chapter 1. It's important to get the context because if you just read, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You can very easily walk away with that thinking that he's talking about individual people and that God just determined that... Hey, Esau is going to serve Jacob, and I hate Esau, and I love Jacob. Because that's the spin they're trying to put on this. But that is not what the Bible is teaching at all. And if you know your Bible, and if you know these stories, and if you know what it's talking about, and if you do the research and you look it up, you're going to see that it's not talking about salvation. Amen. Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved es Jacob, and I hated Esau. 
There's the reference, right? That's where it's written. I've loved Jacob and hated Esau, but let's keep reading. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Verse 4, whereas Edom saith, okay, now who's Edom? Is that an individual? No, Edom is never referred to as Esau. They're the descendants of Esau. That is the nation of Edom. Right. Edom saith, we are impoverished. Not I am impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build. Who? The Edomites. But I will throw down, and they shall call them, the Edomites, the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Does God hate Esau, the person? No. God hates Edomites, the, the nation, the wicked, sinful nation of Edom. That's who he has indignation against. This is not talking about an individual salvation at all. Go back, if you would, to Romans chapter 9. See how important it is to get the context of this and, and, and look at the references? Because both in Genesis 25 and in Malachi chapter 1, it is clear he's talking about nations. He is not talking about an individual at all. Now, there's a lot more you could learn about the character of the individuals that can be the result of why did their descendants turn out the way they did, but that's a whole other study, and that has nothing to do with election. That has nothing to do with God picking and choosing the way people are going to be. God knew Jacob before he was formed in the womb. He knew what type of person he was going to be. He knew that I believe, you know, he knew he was going to be saved and everything else, and he chose him to be the, the progenitor of Jesus Christ. But he's not picking and choosing Jacob to be saved and Esau to go to hell, just arbitrarily or for whatever reason that he has, this, that's the way it's going to be. That's not what this teaches. Romans 9, look at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion will have on whom I have compassion. Guess what? We've got another reference to the Old Testament here. He said this to Moses now. Let's take a look at it. Exodus 33. Keep your finger in Romans 9. We're coming back. You say, Pastor Bersons, is this really how I'm supposed to read the Bible? It looks like a lot of work. Yeah, it is. But do you want to understand the Bible or not? Or do you just want to be led astray by every false prophet that wants to teach you some perversion and, and whatever you know, prophecy of their own heart? I want to know the truth. Amen. So let's study the Bible. Let's, let's dig up our, roll up our sleeves a little bit and do some work. Exodus 33, look at verse number 13. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Who's Moses talking about? This nation. Verse 14, and he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. There it is. There's that, that phrase that is quoted again in Romans chapter 9. He saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. The context of Exodus 33 is in regards to the nation. Is any of this talking about the salvation of an individual? In any of these references, it, when he's talking to Moses even in Exodus 33, is he saying, well, you know, whoever I decide to, to give eternal life to, they're going to get it. And whoever I decide not to, they're not going to get it. 
Is eternal life reference? Is everlasting life reference? Is hell reference? Are any of the things reference? If you want to understand a doctrine regarding salvation, are you going to turn to these passages and say, see, there it is. That's not what he's talking about at all. Go back to Romans chapter 9. Verse number 16 of Romans 9. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith, uh-oh, we're going back to the scripture again. The scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. This is a very important point because we see God's influence on, a per on an individual in this case. Okay? But again, we're going to see what he's talking about. All the way up to this point, there is no dealing with an individual person. Definitely not talking about salvation. But turn, if you would, to Exodus 9 because we're going we're to see here what, what the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh where... Um, Moses gives Pharaoh the word of the Lord saying that, you know, God has raised you up for this purpose so that he might make his, his power known. Um, if God wants to prove something or show people something, he can use whomever he wants to achieve his purpose. Right? Of course he can. God has that power and, and, and God does that and he uses people to, to, to get a point across to, to, for whatever his purpose is, he uses people. We see God intervening many times in the Bible. This isn't something new. God, you know, th there's kind of this big spectrum, right? We believe generally God's somewhat hands off, but not completely. God definitely gets involved in the matters of people's lives. He answers prayers. He performs miracles, you know, and, and, and he lifts up people into positions of power to end up serving his purpose. He allowed Judas Iscariot to infiltrate the disciples for that purpose to, to, to result, to you know, knowing what was going to happen. He, he allows things to happen. He even causes certain things to happen. But in all of these instances, or in none of those instances, I should say, do we see him choosing a person to be saved? So what do we see with Pharaoh? Is Moses going to Pharaoh in order to get Pharaoh saved? Is that his purpose in, in confronting Pharaoh? No. If you know the story, it's not. What is his purpose? Let me and the children of Israel go and worship our God. And then we'll come back. He says, we need to go. We need to offer some sacrifices. We need to go and be obedient unto our God. Let us go. We need to take a break from work. You know, give us a holiday and, we're coming and we'll come back. That's why Moses went to Pharaoh. That's all he was requesting. Let us go. We'll be right back as soon as we're done worshiping God. We don't know exactly what it is he wants us to do, but we need to go out here. We can't do this in front of you because it's abominable to the Egyptians, so we need to go off and, and perform our sacrifices and worship the Lord. He didn't go to Pharaoh saying, you, you know, to believe on the Lord in order, in order for him to receive eternal life. We don't see that once. So when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, was that regarding his own personal salvation? No. Now, there are lessons, again, you can, you can make applications of this scenario being like someone becoming reprobate. You may be able to get some, some knowledge or some wisdom from that and trying to make an application. But specifically, this is not saying, when, when, when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, it's in context talking about because of these plagues that have happened, God hardens his heart and not letting the children of Israel go. God makes it so he doesn't let them go and do the thing. It's not even saying so, th so that Pharaoh can't get saved. It's just saying he's not letting them go and do the thing. Look at verse, uh, you're in Exodus chapter 9. Look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. That's what he's asking for. Let my people go to serve me. Verse 14, For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart and upon thy servants 
and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee and thy people with pestilence, and thou shalt be cut off from the earth. See, what God's doing, he's proving a point that he is who he says he is, and don't mess with God. I mean, basically, it's, I am God. You worship and serve these false gods. They can't do any of this stuff. God is real, and I'm going to show it to you. And you better let my people go, or else. And here's the or else. And God's proving himself, because you know what happened? The whole world knew about what happened in Egypt. This was a big thing that happened where everybody talked about it. I mean, these, th these proofs that happened were undeniable. Nothing but the power of God to explain what happened. Let's keep reading here, though. Look at verse 16. And in very deed, for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. That was God's purpose. He wanted his name to be spread abroad. And the way that he decided to do that was to use the mighty nation of Egypt. And this particular Pharaoh, whom God had blessed to get to the position that he was in, he lifted him up. He allowed for him to get to that position because anyone who gets to these positions, you know, there's oftentimes a lot of circumstance that gets you in to be, to be you know, a leader or a ruler or whatever, what have you. And God's saying, he's the perfect guy for this job. And God could know a lot about people. He knows people's hearts. He knows the reins. He knows, he knows everything about you. He could already know this person doesn't like to hear anything about the truth. He doesn't like to know about me. He doesn't, you know, so... He'll be great for me to lift up into this position of power. Does that imply that God is just sending him to hell because he wants to? Because he's just, well, I'm just going to make him go to hell just arbitrarily. No. Let's keep reading here, though. So, so that's what he said. This is you know, for this cause he raised him up. Verse number 17. As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people that thou wilt not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. God, in his foreknowledge, made it so that this Pharaoh was in power and was exalted in his power so that the whole world can hear how mighty the Lord is and bring glory to his name. That's why God did what he did with Pharaoh. And it's the same way that God brought Joseph up. Right? It's, it's similar. It's not the same way. With Pharaoh, it's like a negative example. Of, of demonstrating his power. But with Joseph, it's like a positive example where Joseph had all these horrible circumstances happen to him, right? He was sold into slavery. He goes, he goes and, he's, and he's working for uh, Potiphar. He's, you know, there's all these various things happening in Joseph's life. And lo and behold, he ends up being the second in charge to Pharaoh. Amazing, right? Well, God led him in that way. God made it happen so that he would be in that position. He gave him the interpretation of the dreams. He allowed him to come into that position of power and put him there for his purpose. Why? Because then everyone at that time knew the Lord was God. Because Joseph revealed the secrets that he gave the credit to God for. He was able to save the people through this horrible famine and bring deliverance, not only to the Egyptian people and the people that land, but to his own people, the children of Israel. Right. They all received deliverance from God. As a result of God being involved in people's lives. But as with Pharaoh, the same with Joseph, he wasn't, this has nothing to do with them being saved. Now, he chose a saved man. He chose someone who was a believer to be used in a positive way. And he chose someone who was an unbeliever to be used in a negative way. Right. But he's not making the choice for them. Right. Romans chapter 9, verse 18. Therefore hath he have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. The Calvinist tries to tell you that Romans 9 is the evidence as to why 
God picks and chooses who gets saved and who doesn't. We looked up every reference that was mentioned from the Old Testament. There is nothing to back up the claim that this is referring to how God deals with people getting saved. Not one. And not only that, I mean, the, and see, but you could see if you just read this portion, don't look at anything else. And especially every time you read it, if someone's already told you and put it into your mind, this is how people get saved, this is why, this is why God picks and chooses who can be saved, that's all you're going to see. Right. Was there anything that seemed dishonest about the way that, I, that I'm going through and presenting the information here in Romans chapter 9? There is no hidden agenda here. We're looking up the references and we're looking at all the similarities that pop up. In every case, he's talking about a nation. Every case. And in zero cases is it talking about personal salvation. But not only that, you know, obviously the clear context of this teaching is referring to how God does work in people's lives, but that has nothing to do with salvation, and how God deals with nations. But um, not only do we have this evidence, just the teaching that God picks and chooses who's going to be saved contradicts a host of other scriptures from the New Testament, or from the whole Bible, for that matter, not just the New Testament. Um, if it's God's will that he picks certain people to go to hell and certain people to be saved, that contradicts 2 Peter chapter 2 or chapter 3, verse number 9. Because if we want to know what God's will is regarding salvation, the Bible tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's will is that nobody perishes. That's God's will. Now, what type of, if, if you believe in this nonsense of the sovereign God, everything that he wants, he just does, and that's the way it happens, then how is it that anybody perishes and goes to hell? Without contradicting this verse that God's not willing that any should perish. You know how they try to answer that? Well, any doesn't really mean any. All doesn't mean all. And they just, just completely warp and pervert the Bible and the Scripture. God doesn't want anyone to go, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved everybody, the world. You know, the Bible tells us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, right? God loved the world, meaning all the people of the world. 1 Timothy 4.10 For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Jesus Christ died for everyone. And that's a whole other point of Calvinism that we're not going to really deal with tonight because they don't think that Jesus Christ died for everybody. Only the people who God chose to be saved are the people that Jesus Christ died for. No. He's the Savior of all men. Amen. All men. Everywhere. He is their Savior but they need to put their faith in him in order to be saved. That's why it says, specially of those that believe. Why is it special for those that believe? Because he actually saves them. He is the Savior, but he only saves those that believe. And with Calvinism, it all boils down to free will. You know, they, they try to use Romans chapter 9 to prove that we don't really have free will because God's just picking and choosing. Well, again, if that's the case, it, it contradicts Scripture. It contradicts the Bible. The word free will in the King James Bible is found 17 times. Do, do the word search on it. And most of the references are talking about the free will offering. Remember all the different sacrifices, the, the, the sin atonement, you know, the, the sacrifice for sin, and, and all, just all the various sacrifices you read in the Old Testament. One of the, the offerings was a free will offering. You know what? The free will offering was not mandatory. The sin offerings were mandatory. The, the, the daily, the, the morning and evening sacrifices were mandatory. All these things had to be done according to the law. Why is a free will offering not mandatory? Because then it's not free will. <laughs> because it's what do you want to do? Do we have a will or not? Well, the Bible teaches we have a will. 
We have a desire. It's what we want. It is not God imposing a will on us. It is actually our will. And the fact that God is capable of creating a creature, his creation to, have, to possess free will, is amazing in and of itself. We as human beings can create things. We do create things. We can create artificial intelligence. We create computers and software and, and you could create machines and, and robots and things that can perform tasks. We can't create free will. Just total free will. That is something different. And see, what the Calvinists like to think is that God didn't create free will either. That we are just pre-programmed and wired everything the way that a machine would be, a robot would be. Because if we, as human beings, if we create a robot, it's only going to be as good as the software that a man created. I mean, you could do all this fancy code and you could try to randomize things, you could try to do things, but you cannot give it a conscience. You cannot give it its own independent thought. You cannot give it its own will. Because everything would simply just be a result of your programming. Everything. I mean, the, the way that you made it, you, you cannot give it that. God gave us a will. It's incredible. It's up to us to determine what do we believe. Do we believe God? Do we not believe God? That is a testimony to God's power and, and just uh, amazing abilities to even have a creation like that. Right. But uh, I want you to see this reference real quick. Look at Ezra chapter 7. Because most of the time free will is found, again, like I said, it's talking about the free will offering. It's something that God said, well, if you're going to give me an offering, it needs to be done this way. He gave them the outline for it, but he said it's up to you. Now, the cool thing about a free will offering is that that is a way for you to show God that you love him. And it actually means something because it's completely based on what you want to do. It's, it's like this, right? If I, if, I, if I made this fancy robot, this cyborg or whatever, this, this robot that's like, looks just like a person, their skin feels real and stuff, and I programmed it to, every time I come home, tell me how great I am, tell me how much it loves me and everything else. How much meaning is that going to have to me when I programmed it to do that? I told it to do that. It doesn't have a choice. It's going to do that because that's what I programmed it to do. Compare that to a person who has their own will that decides to compliment me, that decides to tell me how much they love me. There's a lot more meaning behind the person who has the actual choice doing that as opposed to something that it doesn't matter. I mean, I could come home and I could throw that robot around and beat it up and take an axe or whatever and it's still going to tell me all the same thing. It doesn't even matter. Like, nothing I do, it's not going to matter at all because that's what I told it to do. That's empty. That's meaningless. That's going to be like, I could make you say anything. What, what does that show me? Nothing. God doesn't want us just to be some robots praising him, telling him how great he is and everything else with no will. That's not as mean, you know, meaningful for him. He gave us the choice. He gave us the, the, the will to say, yeah, I am going to serve God. I do love you, God. I do want to do what you have for me to do. That means a lot more to him because he actually created us to be able to have the choice to either accept or reject him. You're in Ezra chapter 7. Look at verse number 12. We're talking about free will being found in the Bible, a concept of even individuals having free will, even apart from the, the sacrifices, the free will sacrifice. Ezra 7, 12, Outer Xerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and at such a time. So this is the letter that King Outer Xerxes writes. Now, you say, but that's just King Outer Xerxes. Yeah, but it's scripture. I mean, what he wrote is literally written down and penned down in the word of God. As a teaching, not just as like, this is what he said. Because otherwise there'd be no point of it being in the Bible. That didn't have some impact other than it's God's word. Look at verse number 13. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will 
to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. So we have a reference here of people having their own free will, not the way God pre-programmed them. Hey, if they want to, anyone that's minded, anybody that has their free will to go up to Jerusalem, let them go with you. And the reason why I point this out is because I've had arguments, I've had discussions with Calvinists where they say, well, free will is not even found in the Bible. Yes, it is found in the Bible many times. Not only with the free will offering, I say, you know, and I bring up the free will offering, oh, but that's just, an, you know, it's like they want to just blow that off as if it's inconsequential because it's just some sacrifice or some offering. No, it's called free will for a reason. Uh, turn if you would, last place we're going to turn, Revelation 22. But I mean, Ezra 7 is really clear there that people have the free will to make up their mind. Hey, do they want to go or not? It doesn't say the people who God chose to go with you, let them go with you. Revelation 22, we see that salvation is based on our free will of accepting or rejecting that gift. Simple as that. Revelation 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will. Anybody that wants to, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Anybody. Whoever it's, it's their will. God's given us a will. Don't be deceived by the Calvinist that wants to tell you that we don't have free will and that Romans 9 shows you and it's proof and it's evidence that God picks and chooses who's going to get saved. No, he doesn't. This is talking about nations. It's talking about two types of people. It's talking about groups of people. And you want more, more content on that? Look at my sermon, The Salvation of a Nation. The way that God saves a nation is completely different based on works, nothing to do with, with faith. A person's individual soul being saved has everything to do with faith. They're two separate things, two separate concepts. Romans chapter 9, hopefully that helps you understand that chapter a little bit better. And stay tuned, we're going to be covering a lot more. What I want to try to do is cover the difficult, difficult, portions that Calvinists will turn to. I don't think any of them are difficult, but when I should, I should say it more, the passages that they craftily twist out of context, because that's what's being done here. You're not getting the full picture. They're using these phrases and applying it just, just completely in areas that it's not applying to at all. So we'll cover some more in the weeks to come. Let's probably have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much that you are not the author of confusion, that, that you're not going to tell us that, that we have a will when we don't really have a will. We know that you're not going to demand us of things that are impossible of us to do. We know that, that um, that's just not the way you operate, dear Lord, and that you're a truthful God and, and the things that are written in your word are, are not here just to confuse us and confound us. Um, I pray that you would please help us to help us all to be on guard against false doctrine and, and always be humble enough to examine our beliefs and to match them up against scripture dear Lord and God I pray that you please help us be, be strengthened to take the time and dig in and do the study that's necessary so we're not just babes in Christ and just relying on other people to feed us but that we could actually dig into your words and really learn and understand what you're teaching us by going back and researching and looking up all the references that you give in Scripture. The reason why we have the references is so that we could understand what's being taught even more. Lord, help us not to be slack in our reading and in our study, dear Lord. And I pray that you please open up our understanding and, and help us continue to grow as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.